Well, thank you, Tim, and uh, it's great to have you here for uh, week one of our series in Leviticus. What brave people you are. Uh, The reason for the title, You Lost Me at Leviticus, is because for many of us, that's exactly what happens for us when we first try to read the Bible cover to cover. Uh, Reading through the Bible can be kind of like going off-road for the first time, all sorts of unfamiliar terrain in there. And I don't know whether you've ever been four-wheel driving before, but it can be fraught with danger, uh, particularly when you're on sand. Kigari or Fraser Island, as it used to be called, is one of the most fraught places for four-wheel driving and notorious as it has several spaces where the tide can catch you out. Uh, I think we can say these guys here are not getting out anytime soon. And I've got to admit, the, f- the very first time I tried to read the Bible, first time through, uh, I got bogged to the axles in Leviticus. Genesis and Exodus, they're easy reads. Uh, I enjoyed the rich narrative to be found in each of those, the stories of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Joseph in his technicolour dream coat, uh, Moses in his confrontation of Pharaoh. Uh, It's a who's who of great narrative. So I started reading through the Bible filled with a great deal of energy and excitement at the stories I was reading. And then I hit Leviticus. Uh, And it was like hitting quicksand after driving along a bitumen highway. In my first attempt at reading the Bible, I got a few chapters into Leviticus, and that was the end of that. Uh, The second time, I gritted my teeth, and I made it all the way through Leviticus, but only just. I think it was the third or fourth time before I actually began to connect any dots between following Jesus and Leviticus. I love the title, You Lost Me at Leviticus, because I reckon that's true for most of us, if we're honest. Uh, What is this weird Old Testament book of Leviticus uh, about? And what what is it all? uh, What does it mean? Whilst Genesis and Exodus are largely narrative accounts, Leviticus, as the name uh, suggests, is more about practices or rituals, priests and purity and atonement. Uh, After reading... Uh, of those pro- the profoundly creative power of God and his demonstrated love for those who love him and seeking to obey, obey him in Genesis. You know the stories of Noah and Abraham and Sarah. Uh, in Exodus, we read of God's commitment to utilising Moses in leading the children of Israel out of Egypt from under the tyranny of Pharaoh. So in Leviticus, they're out of slavery of Egypt, but now they're in the desert the place in between the tyranny of Egypt and the freedom of the promised land. I find it fascinating that it's in the desert that God takes Moses aside and shares with him a way that the people of God can relate to God and keep relationship with him safely. It's a whole other sermon series, but God meeting his people in the desert and the wilderness and the lonely places is a theme that you'll find throughout the entire corpus of scripture. It's all over the place if you look for it. Leviticus takes place in the desert and it begins and ends with God instructing Moses. Leviticus 1 tells us, the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. He said, and then there's 27 chapters of instructions about practices, priests, purity and atonement. Uh, Why don't you turn to the person next to you, I want you to try this on, and say authoritatively to them, Leviticus is about practices, priests, purity and atonement. Try it on, I'm going to put it up for you so you can cheat. Try it on, go for it. Practices, priests, purity and atonement. Okay, you look like you've got it, so we can go home now. Don't you wish that were true? Uh, We actually borrowed this outline from a Bible project and their summary of Leviticus. It's actually brilliant. The presentation is about eight minutes long, super easy to understand, well worth a watch for a good overview of Leviticus. So after 25 chapters of instruction about practices, 
or rituals, priests, purity, and atonement. There's another couple of chapters at the end underlining the need for obedience and faithfulness. And then in chapter 27, the book of Leviticus ends as abruptly as it starts. These are the commands the Lord gave Moses at Mount Sinai for the Israelites. So over the next few weeks, we want to take you on a little adventure through what might be unexplored terrain for you. Leviticus is a book that has been mischievously misquoted and pilloried for centuries. I watched it happen only a few weeks ago on an episode of West Wing, and mostly by people, uh, the, the, uh, the mocking it mostly comes from people who have a vested interest in undermining both the idea, the idea of God and the authority of God's word. So how should we read it? How can we read Leviticus in such a way as to draw us closer to Jesus? Well, over the next few weeks, we're going to do a little exploratory tour of Leviticus through the outline that I mentioned before, uh, practices, priests, purity and atonement. Uh, and this week, we're going to hone in on the practices or rituals found at the beginning and toward the end of Leviticus. A weird blend of sacrifices and feasts for us to briefly explore. But before we open the word today, I want to pray that we don't get bogged. Not today or over the next couple of weeks. Let's pray together. Lord, we uh, come to you this morning with a great many things on our hearts and minds. Lord, lots of us have come into the room with all sorts of stuff from yesterday and even tomorrow. Lord, I ask that you'd penetrate that this morning, that you would speak to us where we're at and speak through the haze of our situation and circumstances. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, when we are on leave this year, a photo and uh, video footage came through on uh, WhatsApp from a mate of mine, Dave, and his wife, Julie Rock, and they were bog, bogged to the axles in sand on a beach in the middle of nowhere. Uh, they were alone with nobody to help, and the tide was coming in. Um, but watching the video, they looked like they were having an absolute blast. You would never have known that they were in difficulty. They were both laughing and Dave was talking Jules through how he was planning to get himself out. Uh, the reason Dave was so relaxed was experience and know-how. He'd been there before, he knew what it was, he knew what he was doing, and he had experience at doing it. And rather than it being a catastrophic end to their holiday, which it would have been if it was me, uh, it became part of the adventure along the way. So experience and know-how doesn't just reduce risk in four-wheel driving, it actually reduces risk in Bible reading too. People are often afraid to venture into books like Leviticus, either because they've heard it misquoted so many times, or like me, they've tried it and gotten bogged up to the axles trying to drive meaning from it. So to get himself out of this little predicament, my mate Dave uh, had to use a winch to anchor his car to a rock that was external to his predicament. And that's how we're going to read Leviticus over the next few weeks. We're going to continuously refer back to Jesus and the New Testament, mostly through Hebrews, to aid understanding and enable us to find meaning in the text. But be first, the big picture. Probably the best overall explanation I've heard for why Leviticus is necessary for the people of God was actually given by the Bible Project. They outline the problem of holiness, specifically the idea that if holiness were heat, then God would be like the sun. Now, the sun is good. It brings light and life and warmth. But if you go too close to it, things are not going to end well for you. Mercury is a lot closer to the sun than we are, and apparently it's a balmy 430 degrees Celsius during daylight hours. Now, I don't care what SPF sunscreen you wear, considering we fry chips at about 160 degrees Celsius, I think we can say 430 degrees is not conducive to living. But what happens when holiness and power, that is greater than the power of the sun, wishes to get 
close to us. How do you facilitate that? That's an incredibly difficult and tricky thing to do. A tiny example of how dangerous the holiness of God is to the human condition can be found in Exodus, indeed all the way through the Old Testament. In Exodus we're told that Moses said, now God show me your glory. And the Lord said, I'll cause my goodness to pass in front of you. I'll proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. So in order that Moses can see God's glory, the account goes on, uh, God puts Moses in a little crevice, in a little gap in the rocks, puts his hand over him to stop him from being fried. And then after he's passed by, Moses is allowed to look at his back from a distance. That's as close as he's allowed to get. And that's Moses. And that action, those shielding actions, that protective action actually saves Moses' life. In order that Moses can see God's glory, God does these things. If holiness were heat, God would be the sun. God wants to show Moses mercy and compassion, but even Moses will lose his life if he is exposed to the unshielded holiness of God. We don't think of this as followers of Jesus. We don't think of the power and might and holiness of Almighty God. We often forget. So Yahweh is unable to allow Moses full access to his glory because it'll be too much. It's kind of like a process and shielding that save Moses from God's holiness. A way to look at Leviticus is it's a way of a holy God shielding and protecting the, the children of Israel as he seeks to set them apart and ultimately connect with them as his people. Leviticus is a kind of a closing the gap between God's holiness and that of his people. And all of this seems to take time and effort. In Exodus, Yahweh begins to close the gap by giving the Ten Commandments to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai. All the people see of God is a terrifying presence up on a mountain, way up on a mountain, that they're actually unable to approach. And just in case you're failing to see how incompatible God's holiness is with humanity, in Exodus, it's made pretty clear that the people need to stay away, among other things, for their own safety. Have a look at this. <clears throat> the Lord said to Moses, go to the people, consecrate them today and tomorrow, make them wash their clothes and be ready. By the third day, because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. Seems a little harsh, doesn't it? The instruction, it looks harsh to the untrained eye, but there are not uh, a set of, these are not a set of rules so much as a series of safety instructions. The Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible, are littered with the bodies of people who made the mistake of ignoring God's holiness. God's not being cruel or heartless, or vindictive, the truth is that any violation of his holiness is going to be hazard to the people of God. And God knows this. So Yahweh is simply trying to limit the damage by laying out consequence. Go too close to the sun and you will be burnt. And so I reckon it's helpful if you can read the rules and ideas in Leviticus as a kind of series of safety instructions as much as anything else. The dilemma is real. How can a holy God draw closer to his people without them being incinerated by his holiness? It's a tricky business, isn't it? It's a delicate process, bringing holiness to the people of God. Initially, God does this from the top of Mount Sinai, where among other things, he gives Moses the Ten Commandments, a code for living that sets the Israelites apart and begins to close the holiness gap. At the beginning of Leviticus, this, is prof this profoundly holy God moves to close the gap further. In Leviticus, God doesn't just speak from up on a mountain. 
but instead speaks to Moses from the tent of meeting right in the middle of the camp. So you see, it. he's closing the gap. He's getting closer. God, who had to keep himself clear of the camp for the sake of everyone in it, can now make himself present in the camp, safely enclosed in the tabernacle. Not without making other arrangements to deal with the holiness gap. So practices, priests, and purity and atonement, they're all ways by which Yahweh seeks to deal with the holiness gap between himself and his people. Today, we briefly touch down into the practices or rituals of Leviticus in which God begins and ends Leviticus with rituals or practices that enable the people of God to demonstrate repentance, practice thanksgiving, and thus close the holiness gap a little more. We're going to be moving at a skiing pace rather than a snorkeling pace. So we're zipping over the top of it rather than stopping and foraging around. Uh, so the idea is to give you a clear over overview rather than an in-depth verse-by-verse analysis. I just want to give you enough today to keep you motivated and moving for next time you read Leviticus and hopefully stop you getting bogged in the detail. Needs to be said that chapters 1 to 7 are about ritual sacrifice for sins and to express thanksgiving. So whilst you're reading Leviticus, when you give it a try, notice that God requires the people to take responsibility for their sins by participating in ritual. And he does this in such a way to include them without putting them in harm's way. You know, Joanne often does baking with my granddaughter Heidi, uh, as she used to do with my kids when they were little. Uh, and when baking with the kids, she includes them at their level of understanding. Okay, let's stir the ingredients in. They get involved, the chubby little hands stirring the ingredients in. Uh, and who's going to lick, lick the spoon when we're finished? Yes, that's right, Papa is going to, <laughs> to lick the spoon when we're finished. No, just kidding. But you get what I mean, right? Uh, it would be unsafe and not loving at all to include Heidi in the more technical and risky elements. She doesn't hand them the kids a knife and say, look, cut that stuff up, up for me, or take hot things out of the oven. Because of her love for them, she gives the little ones tasks that they can participate in safely. Have a look at how God lowers the bar for the people enable, uh, to enable them to be involved in sacrifice. Speak to the Israelites and say to them, when anyone among you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. That's pretty simple. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you're able to offer a male without defect. You must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. So he's involving them. You are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. Now, spoiler alert, it gets very gory fairly shortly thereafter. Uh, it gets fairly gory and M-rated. So we might just give that piece a miss, but I want you to read it in your own time. You get a look, there's involvement actually in the sacrifice uh, and there is involvement of the people of God. Uh, needless to say, the people are invited to be involved with the sacrifice of the animal right up to placing it on the altar, which is the priest's role. It's fascinating that the sacrificial processes are a kind of collaboration between the people of God and the priests of God and God himself. And it would seem that even at these early stages, God is wanting the people to be close enough to the sacrifice to understand the cost of their sin. They're immersed in it. First time I read all the way through Leviticus, that's what struck me. The cost of staying holy before a holy God was actually incredibly high. My best guess is that if I lived in those times, firstly, I would probably never leave the altar. And secondly, I reckon I'd probably run out of cattle, sheep, birds and grain probably in the first few weeks uh, while the, the tabernacle was open for business. We forget what we've been delivered from, don't we? 
We forget that the God Jesus calls us, teaches us to call Abba or Daddy is terrifyingly holy. What you'll find in the first seven chapters of Leviticus is a lot of deaths of animals. And you'll see the blood of those animals being sprinkled by the specially anointed and trained priests, all in order to enable the children of Israel to draw near to God without being vaporised by his holiness. In this picture, we have each family taking responsibility for their sin, and the cost of that sin is in your face. Not only is the best of your herd or flock required, with the help and instructions of the priest, except for birds, I'm not sure how that works, but anyway, they're there for the poor apparently. Anyway, in sacrificing the best of your flock, you're not only asked to provide the sacrifice, but actually to participate in it. In Leviticus, you're the one called to put your livestock to death on your own behalf. Messy, violent, gory, scary, necessary in order to deal with the gap between a holy God and his unholy people. If you read the account in Leviticus, you'll find the person offering the sacrifice literally gets their hands dirty. It's a messy process. It's a very confronting series uh, of procedures. And I suspect that the cost of sin was never far from the average Israelite in those times. So let me put this out there just for our further pondering. When was the last time we considered the cost of our sin? Seriously. We don't give it a second thought, do we? We have absolutely no idea how offensive our sin is before God. And we have absolutely no idea of how costly that same sin is. The beauty of reading Leviticus is we get an unfiltered view of God's holiness and what kind of effort it takes to bridge the enormous gulf between his holiness and ours. The cost of sacrifice for the average Israelite was high and right up in their face. God, in his commitment to them and love for them, gave them a way to move towards him and the principles still stand. Hebrews states this pretty clearly. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. You know, every time we take communion, we celebrate this. When we read Leviticus, the words of Jesus as he took the first communion on the night that he was betrayed, begin to make sense. Jesus, as he took the cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it, he gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It's poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Jesus didn't just die as a martyr. Jesus didn't just die as a victim of the state. Jesus didn't just die merely to save his friends. When we read Leviticus, we realise that Jesus died so that anyone can live in relationship with a holy God. Hebrews tells us that just as each person is destined to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take the sins of many people. He'll come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. Jesus is the image of a holy God who's so desperate to connect with humankind, he becomes one of us. So desperate to close the gap, to remove the obstacles to his holiness, that he sent Jesus to die and rise again so that we might do the same. But if you don't read Leviticus, you really won't get a full sense of that. The first seven chapters of Leviticus gives us a really clear and detailed view of how detestable and incompatible our sin is before a holy God. For those of us who follow Jesus, Leviticus is a reason to be thankful for God, which brings us to another component of the practice and rituals. In both the early chapters regarding sacrifices, specifically chapter 3 and the later chapters, 
regarding feasts and celebrations in thanksgiving to God. Unlike the feasts of other nations surrounding Israel, the feasts of Yahweh weren't occasions to lose control or engage in wild behaviour. Rather, the feasts and celebrations were an occasion of thanksgiving and costly remembrance. Makes for an interesting read. Three things to note about the thanksgiving uh, rituals, particularly at the end. Uh, firstly, the feasts are costly. Feasts and thanksgiving offerings were costly. There's no such thing as a festival without sacrifice. From Sabbath to the festival of harvest, there always was a cost to thanking God. The closest I could find to a, a low cost option or festival uh, was the festival of trumpets. I don't know. Uh, in chapter 23, which is kind of a Sabbath marked by trumpets. It doesn't sound very relaxing to me, to be honest. But it's like a Sabbath, but they blow trumpets every so often during the Sabbath. Uh, it, were, it was the lowest cost I could find, but it still meant a day of lost work, which, in, which is very costly in an agri-based business economy. So there's no such thing as thanksgiving, thanksgiving without cost. The second thing that we note is that some of the feasts and thanksgiving celebrations enabled everything from land care to social justice. It's kind of weird. Uh, thousands of years ago, God established his green credentials. Uh, with his people in Leviticus 25, he built a Sabbath year in for the land every seventh year. Apparently, this is unbelievably good practice. Um, we stopped doing it a long time ago. Uh, they're just starting to do it again because they realise that it works. So the land, every seven years, was supposed to rest under those commands. No planting. Everybody was able to access it for food during that year, including wild animals. Uh, how about that? Uh, there it is right there, stewardship of the land and the earliest national parks where wild animals could roam free and eat freely. And I'm pretty sure that God would be on board with the creation care team. I'm just saying. I think there are credentials there. And it's very specifically noted in these acts of thanksgiving. In the same chapter as the act of thanksgiving, there is a year of jubilee, where every 50th year, people were given the opportunity to reset. So those who'd fallen on hard times, the opportunity to buy back into family property, also a time which calls, uh, God calls for debts to be forgiven, slaves to be set free, and this act of thanksgiving is a profound act of social justice, and it's way ahead of its time. All of these things are costly, but they're demanded by God as an act of thanksgiving and a move toward his holiness. Finally, and importantly, God insists that these feasts and acts of thanksgivings are done in community. Everybody is expected to participate. Scholars seem to agree these community events help shape Israel's identity, to bind the people of God together in thanksgiving and worship, and most importantly, to set them apart or help them to grow in holiness together. Now, I want to end on that note. We began with the notion of God's holiness today, the idea that sacrifices and rituals in Leviticus help the people of God connect with a holy God by becoming holy. It's, interested, it's interesting to note that Leviticus uses the word holy more than any other book of the Bible, 56 times to be precise. Interestingly, the only book that goes close is Acts, with 54 times. And it's because Acts describes the presence of God repeatedly. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moving among the people of God. How about that? The very same presence of God that could vaporise us is offered to us to dwell within us through Jesus. Leviticus is a picture of God bringing holiness to his people. Acts is a picture of God bringing holiness in his people. In Leviticus 19, 
the Lord says to Moses, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. The consensus among scholars is that kadosh or holy in the Hebrew literally means set apart or single down. Not only is Yahweh set apart, he wants his people to be as well. Now, I don't know what pressures the pressures are for you at the moment, but it's always been for the people of God that the world around us is seeking to shape us and form us into its image of what we should be. For the Israelites, it was the surrounding nations with their little g gods and their detestable practices. For us, it's often more subtle, but infinitely more likely for us to be shaped by the world that we live in. So whether the influence is through the news cycle or social media or podcasts or music that we listen to uh, or the people that we surround ourselves with, the world wants to shape us and mould us into it, its image. The world wants us to strive to be successful with all we have because our world is all about success at any cost. God wants us to be holy because he's holy. The world wants us to strive to be wealthy at every turn because the world is all about wealth at any cost. God wants us to be holy because he's holy. The world wants us to be popular and fit in because the world is about popular and fitting in at any cost. God wants us to be holy because he is holy. The world wants to us to adopt its moral code above God's because the world sees itself as independent from God and all that God wants for us. God wants us to be holy because he is holy. We're being formed and each of us gets a choice about what is forming us. And so this morning we'll finish with the word that defines Leviticus and the word that is supposed to define us as God's people. Holy. Set apart. Singled out. Just let that wash over you for a minute. No matter what's been happening in your week, that's who he's called you to be. That's the kind of people he wants us to be, together and apart. In Leviticus, sacrifices and feasts were needed to be this. Now the offer is still on the table, but it comes through Christ. Ask yourself this morning, does God's holiness define mine? Does it? Let's just close our eyes for a moment and sit with that. Sit with the word and hear the call of God in it. Holy. Set apart. Singled out. He created us for so much more than the world around us offers. Why would we not allow him to set us apart? Hear his voice to you this morning. Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Let's bring ourselves before Almighty God this morning. Let's pray. So Lord, we bring ourselves before you this morning. And we ask afresh that you set us apart. We thank you for Jesus' death and resurrection that makes it possible. So in the name of Jesus, we ask you to cleanse us from anything that is not pleasing to you. Just offer anything that is not where it should be 
right now, just offer that to him now. Lord, we ask that you help us to live a life worthy of our calling. Forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that we might not just know the word holy, but live it. And live it in a way that transforms the world around us. Lord, let us become holy as you are holy. Set apart. Singled out for purpose. And we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.